there's three words that um, I like to talk about, and that is good, better, and best. So what do they mean to me? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm not blowing smoke or anything. This organization is good. And I'll tell you one way that I know it, other than obviously being here every day, is I get a lot of letters, a lot of notes, a lot of cards, a lot of personal comments about the service that they've gotten, you know, that they can see well. Obviously, vision's very important to people. Um, and of course, they mention me. You know, you would expect that. I'm the one that operated on them. But I would say at least 75% mention the staff. Dr. Fitchman, blah, 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 blah. I'm so happy you and the staff. So that's how I know you're good, because they wouldn't say it if, if we weren't all really invested in what we're doing. It's a team. So in my life, that second word is what my life is all about. I always want to be thinking that I'm getting better, whether it's planting a garden, whether it's uh, painting a room, whether it's uh, doing eye surgery. I mean, I've been doing eye surgery for a long time. I've done 50,000 cases. Of the metropolitan area has a population of 500,000 people, so it's a, it's a lot of people. And the third word is best. So there's two ways to look at best. Somewhere there is the best eye practice in the United States. You look at that sign up there, why not be the best? Why, why can't we be the best? Why does it have to be somebody in Ohio or California or Georgia? Somewhere there's the best cataract surgeon in the United States. Why can't that be me? Why can't I work harder and get better? That's one way to look at it. The other part of best is within yourself to be the best that you can be. And I think that's what the challenge is every day, to go and do things that are a little harder than you thought you'd be able to do and to, to do the very best that you're capable of doing. And by doing that, when you're in a team and working together, that's when the practice really starts to hum. You know, it has a buzz to it, and I, and I sense that. So I'd like everybody for just a second to think, who were you the first day you walked into this practice? And who are you now? Has this practice provided an environment that allows you to grow? Do you have a level of confidence in yourself, not just in delivering ophthalmic care or answering phones or making appointments or getting out the bills, but just confidence in yourself that you've, you've taken on something and you're, you're good at it and you feel really good about yourselves. Because I see that when I walk around here. I, I see through the body language, with the masks, it makes it a little bit difficult, but I see it on your face. I know that a lot of you are, just have a lot more confidence in yourself than you did when I interviewed you and you came in here. And that's one of the joys in my life. So this is Robert F. Kennedy, John Kennedy's brother. When I was a kid, um, very young, you know, the president unfortunately was shot, as was this man. But he had a saying, um, it, it came from George Bernard Shaw. He, he kind of changed it a little bit, but he said, some people see things as they are and ask why. I see things as they should be and ask why not. And that's always had, you know, it's really stuck in my mind. Why do we have to accept things that are mediocre or that we know are wrong? To wit, as a young ophthalmologist, yes, I was a young ophthalmologist at one point, um, I watched people do retrobulbar injections. Now, most of you probably don't even know what that is, but it's where you stick a needle right here and it goes up. It numbs all the pain receptors, it numbs all the motion. So you have to wear a patch because it numbs your eyelid. But number one, is there anyone here that can possibly imagine how incredibly painful it is to get a needle behind your eye? I mean, don't the kids say stick a needle in your eye? So you have to really drug the people up and it just, the whole thing, for something as delicate as eye surgery, it just always made me very uncomfortable. And then there's always the fear that the needle's gonna pierce the eye and if you inject an anesthetic into, the, actually into the eyeball, the patient's gonna go blind. And then afterwards, they're, eye is all red and swollen and the lid is drooped and then you had to put sutures in and it just seemed to me very crude. So here I am, I, I mean I'm an absolute nobody. I have a tiny little practice and I set upon trying to figure a way that you could get around giving injections and using uh, sutures and I did come up with something. It took a lot of time and trust me, 
Ophthalmology is a very, very buttoned down specialty. It's not, people don't take to change a lot and they certainly didn't take to some, some kid from uh, central Connecticut telling everybody you don't need to, to use needles, but it turns it into something that is so much more pleasant for the patients. And, and you guys see that afterwards. It used to be when I operated on someone, even if they came out with 20-20 vision six months down the road, they didn't want their other eye done. It was just a, a tremendous ordeal, and now they, they actually want that done. So I came up with something that changed the world. You know how many people in the world have had this technique is somewhere between 100 million and 200 million people. So it's a lot, and I, it's not because I'm a genius, because I think you guys work by my side, and you know I'm not a genius, but it's because something troubled me, and I really you know, wanted to figure a way that I could get around it and do something different. And it, a lot of it has to do with what this gentleman talked about. There's three levels of employment, a job, a career, and a calling. Some of you came in here for a job. I hope that all of you have found that this is a career and that you've learned and grown and had opportunities to do different things. And then a calling is just something where you feel like this is what you were put on the planet for. And it, I see the way some of you talk to people. I walked by my friend Cynthia the other day and, and, and there was somebody being very mean to her on the phone. And, and I could hear that. And I'm going to talk in the future about passion, but there's also dispassion. What's dispassion? Dispassion means that when somebody's right in your face, right in your grill, that you can put the veneer on and be respectful because that's what people kind of expect from us. And Cynthia was really getting it full blast from a guy that was not a nice person. So I've got a nickel in my pocket. Yeah, I got a nickel in my pocket. Who can tell me one word that when you look at somebody, you would say, they're a success. What's one word that you would judge that by? I think some people would say money. You know, if they're living, you know, in a big house and they're driving the fancy Maserati or the Lamborghini and they got, you know, nice clothes on and they go to the finest restaurant, they're successful. And in some ways, society does try to reward people, um, you know, that are above um, by giving them money. But I would say if you had a choice of someone who won the lottery for $10 million and the teacher of the year, who would be more successful? When I think about success, one of the things I think about is how do you get from here to there? Because there's always a pathway and it, it needs to be kind of thought out. So let me tell you the pathway that I've developed for success. First thing, you have to identify a problem. There's plenty of problems. You have to identify a problem that you actually want to do something with. Let's say that the problem is, you know, this room, by the way, was painted by my son when he was in high school. So you identify the problem. The paint color's a little drab. The, you know, the, the paint's flicking off. Um, there's some areas that need, you know, a little sprucing up. So that's the problem. You make a plan. Okay, the plan is I'm going to take a weekend and I'm going to paint the room. I'm going to go on Wednesday after work. I'm going to buy the paint, the paintbrush, the rollers, the tarp, the tape, the whole deal. And by Sunday afternoon, I'm going to have a nice, freshly painted room. You implement the plan. You do the things that you said you were going to do, right? Because if you, you know, woke up at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on Saturday, you ain't going to get the the room painted, so you know, you gotta discipline yourself. Okay, so the next one is actually the most important of the whole thing. You assess the outcomes. So let's say that I went in there, I, I went uh, Wednesday night, I got all the supplies, I put the tarp down, I painted, and then I stand back on Sunday about four o'clock and I look and there's a couple of spots that I should have sanded better. The ego-driven person is gonna say, I'm a good painter, I painted it, it's fine, I put two days into it, enough, I'm not going to do it. The mission-driven person is going to say, this is not right. I promised myself I'd do a good job, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to take the time, and I'm going to sand down those spots, I'm going to put the primer back up, I'm going to do whatever I need to do, I'm going to blend in the paint and make it right. Kind of sounds silly, but you have to institute changes sometimes, and that's what this meeting is all about. Despite the fact that I care deeply about everything that goes on here, I'm not doing a good job at some of the things here. And I think you, you don't have to nod because you'll hurt my feelings. But I think, no, and I'm, I, I've, I'm a very tender guy. Um, but you guys know it. 
I, I wasn't trained to be a practice administrator. I'm not trained in all the subtleties that go on behind the scenes. I'm an eye surgeon. I think I'm an okay team leader. I think I'm pretty good at marketing. So I, I think I know what I'm good at, but I also, unfortunately, I know what I'm not so good at. And it, it shows. It shows for me, but it also shows for you guys, because you guys are in the trenches and you're, you're seeing some of the issues that we're having. So I would say let's all be mission driven here. Let's not be ego driven. Anybody here ever eat a carrot? They're delicious, aren't they? You know, a choice between a Swiss chocolate or great hot foot sundae or a pecan pie or a carrot, I mean, everybody's going to choose a carrot, right? Because carrots are unbelievably delicious. As are tomatoes, as are onions and potatoes, tomatoes, tomatoes. Potatoes, you know, they're all just unbelievable. But when you put them all together, you can create a booyah base. So now everything's delicious. So why am I telling you about food? Anybody figure it out? Because the individual is one thing. And carrots are good and tomatoes are good. But when you put things together, you get a product that is much better than any individual element in it. Every person in this room, you probably have never thought about this, but there is no one on the planet that has ever been on the planet, that is on the planet, or will ever be on the planet that's going to be exactly like you. Each person is very different. And so what a team is, to me, is that you take the best and the worst out of people, because everybody except me does have some weaknesses. And some of us are introverts, some of us are extroverts, some of us are detail-driven, some of us see the big picture, some of us are good on the phone, some of us, you know, there, there's a whole range of things. And when you put it all together and with the right spirit, in other words, everybody wants to be on the team, everybody wants to help each other, you kind of fill in the low spots and smooth everything out and you wind up with something that the individual elements could have never achieved. So the four words that may be the most important things in a team is, I've got your back. So what does I've got your back mean? I've got your back means that maybe somebody is at the front desk and they're having a different, difficult phone call, a la Cynthia, and somebody else has a moment, they may say, let me pick up that other line for you, or let me do that data entry or the demographic entry or whatever. Technician has an elderly person that's with a walker. They, they forgot their hearing aid. They've got macular degeneration. And somebody else, another technician, has one of Dr. Two's excellent surgical results. And they're 2020 and happy as a clam, and they can't wait to even get out of the office. So they've got some extra time. I've got your back means that that person is going to come and take the second patient from the first technician because they've got their back. And you know, one of the things is that when you're in an organization like that, you start to feel like, wow, somebody's got my back, and then now I've got to get their back, and then it just gets better and better and better. So now, the five Ps. And they are passion, purpose, pride, persistence, and poise. Those are the things I try and live my life by. You have to be passionate about stuff. You know, I'm passionate about my family, obviously. I'm passionate about my patients. I hope that you guys see that. And if you don't have passion, I feel sorry for you. All right. Purpose. You, you know, it, it's just like you multitask in life, right? This is not the same as being doing eye surgery, but this is just as important. Well, I mean, nothing's as important as doing surgery, but you know what I'm saying. It's just as important to me that this meeting go well. You always got to know what your purpose is and try to do the very best at that particular purpose. And the two things that I hate in life, the two statements are, it's not my job or we always did it that way. And pride, I mean, no matter what it is, do the very best that you can at it. You're not always going to be successful. But I would hate to walk away from something and not be successful and think, well, I didn't really care. So you know, I didn't really try. I don't want that. I don't want that in my life. I don't want that in your life, because that's not the way to feel good about yourself. Society sometimes pushes you in that direction. I would say fight back. And persistence. Does anybody here think I'm persistent? But <laughs> um, just one thing, you know, part of this ambulatory surgery center 
thing that happened, they, we have a bioengineering company that comes periodically and looks at all our equipment, inspects it, makes sure it's safe, it's, no one's going to get a shock from it, that kind of thing, and they put a sticker on it. And then we write them a check. That's the way things work in life. So they, that's needed for the report that we have to submit, and we couldn't get in touch with these people. We emailed them over and over and over again, and they wouldn't respond to our emails. And it isn't good enough to show the people the sticker. It isn't good enough to show them the check. You have to have a little letter that says, we have been there, we inspected this, 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 and this, and they passed. So at 10 o'clock at night, I emailed the vice president of the hospital that employs these people, and by the next morning, we had the letter. That's persistent. So sometimes you're going to try something and it doesn't work. You implemented the plan, you did the whole thing, you assessed the plan, but it didn't work. So what do you do? You just give up and say, I'm not meant to do this? I would say no. I would say that we go back and we figure another way to do it. And I think that's a really important thing. And then poise, which Cynthia and many of you folks have had. Poise with each other. Look, people get on people's nerves. I know that I've been married a long time and my wife has uh, you know, put up with me for a long time. She's very poised. It's really important because we as deliverers of health care are looked at like one small step below the clergy. People don't expect to come in and hear that you're in a bad mood or you haven't got time or you know, I'm really busy. They expect all your attention and they expect you to be nice and calm and have their best interests at heart. And we expect that when we go to, to see a physician or you know, a health care provider also, don't we? And I give you tremendous credit because you know what? They come to the Fitchman Eye Center, and my name happens to be Fitchman, but they're coming because of all the care that everybody gives them. Okay, so you make a plan, you implement the plan. <sighs> Vicki, you remember Donna? Dr. Stroh, were you here when Donna was here? She was my first practice administrator. Now, she started out, I think she was 19 years old, and it was just her and I. Um, we were one step ahead of where we were, you know, when my mom was in the practice. But the practice grew um, to the point where she was in this office. I believe she was here while we still had uh, created the ambulatory surgery center, when we started doing LASIK, all that kind of stuff. And she grew at every level. And she was like really, really good. And she was my partner. And everything ran smoothly. Would you guys say that? And I, I didn't have to worry about anything. Between her demeanor, her honesty, her intelligence, the fact that she was really invested in everything, everything ran smoothly. Ever since that time, I've never had a practice administrator that's, you know, anywhere near like that, in fact. And it, it's probably not their fault, maybe it's my fault, but in fact, I came to a determination like a year and a half or two years ago that I was better off without a practice administrator because I wasn't getting the true story and I've gone down that pathway. So then I came up with the next brilliant idea and use consultants. As a rejoinder, we do have a consultant here, and she actually does a fabulous job. But there's a lot of people that they don't have any skin in the game. They don't have an investment in the practice. So they come and they say what they say. We had somebody that spent three days reviewing our ambulatory surgery center maybe five or six years ago. And I don't know what on earth she did, but she didn't know anything. Um, and then we have a somebody whose only job is to get us through these surveys that we have. Every three years they come and they look at everything and a lot of it is just paperwork, but you have to have the paperwork in order. Everything has to be right. In our exit interview with him, he said, you know, you're probably going to be inspected in about two months. You're in good shape. Great. So we were inspected in about two months and we failed miserably. And I'm going to say this and you're going to say he's exaggerating. He did nothing nothing for three years except you know, charge me. Nothing. And so you see that word reliance. So if you're going to have somebody, a practice administrator, a consultant, you have to be able to rely on them. If you can't rely on them doing it, then you're in worse shape than you were not having anybody because then at least you knew you had to do something. The plan I had, I implemented, I've assessed it, it's not working. What do I do? Hire another practice administrator? Rely on another consultant? I don't think so. Who knows who Donald Rumsfeld was, is? He was the Secretary of Defense during the Iraq War during George W. Bush's time. And he said something that sounds like gibberish. It's 
going to sound like gibberish, but it was actually brilliant. He said, you don't know what you don't know. Now, that sounds ridiculous, right? You don't know what you don't know. Of course, you don't know what you don't know. But if you think about it, it's really brilliant. There are some things you know that you're doing wrong. But there's some things you don't even know about. You don't even know what the question to ask is. And you're doing it wrong, but you don't know that. And that's the spot I'm in. This has turned into a relatively large practice. And I don't know so many things you know, that I should know because I'm the guy in charge. But I don't know those things. And that's disappointing. I'm disappointed in myself because I like to do the best I can. And I don't think that I'm doing the best I can. And you have to come to a realization that you are mission driven, not ego driven. I could sit and say, well, I can do it. I'm smart. I can do everything. Or you can say, you know what, is this really in the best interest of the practice to keep going down this path? Essentially, I've been wearing too many hats. I've been a CEO, COO, CFO. I don't know if you know what those are. Chief Executive Officer, Chief Financial Officer, Chief Operating Officer, the Marketing Director, the IT person. You know what I know about computers? Can we go to the video? the earlier video. It's about me wearing too many hats. I've been thinking lately about what's right and what's wrong and what's the best way to carry on. Been wearing too many hats for too many days I gotta learn to change my ways. Been wearing too many hats for far too long. That's why I sat down and I wrote this song. Just wanna see things for where they're at. Lord, don't give me just even one more hat. I'll do the best that I can, but you got to know I'm just one man. I think I know what I do best. Gotta find somebody to help with the rest. Let's get together and make things right Together we can fight the good fight If we work together and our hearts are pure There just ain't no issue that we can't cure Come on, y'all Too many hands for too many days. Gotta learn to change my ways. Oh my God. So I, a lot of what I think about in life, I know this is an ideation that is really weird, but it's like I'm on a surfboard. If you're on a surfboard, and I don't surf, if you're on a surfboard, you've got to have balance. You've got to constantly be looking at how are things going because the water's moving. You can't just like be on dry land. And then the other thing I think that's really important, my ideation is, I'm looking in the distance. Are there white caps out there? Are there storm clouds? Is there a big wave coming? Should I be moving the surfboard in to dry land? So. I know that sounds kind of weird, but that's kind of the same thing as where we are here. I want to not run the practice for next week. I want to run the practice for five to 10 years from now. I want to make sure that we're set to do things and, and we don't get blasted by a big tsunami or something like that. So um, I have another video.
need a bigger boat. We need to make sure that when COVID or surgery center issues come along or whatever it is, whether to acquire another practice, whether to partner with different people, whether to hire another doctor, whether to hire more technicians, regardless of what it is, that we're not going to get rocked by things that we weren't able to anticipate happening and we weren't able to handle when it did happen. I mean, it's almost a semi-miracle that this practice exists when COVID hit. So without you, where would Fitchman Eye Center be? It wouldn't be anywhere. It'd be back in the days where it was just me and, and maybe somebody at the front desk. So you guys are the Fitchman Eye Center. And the point of the matter is we've got a fabulous team. We really do. And you don't want to let me down, I hope, do you? I don't want to let you down. It's human nature. And this is what I tell people. When a new situation comes along, a new fellow employee, whatever it is, you can look at for the best in that situation in that person, or you can look for the worst, and you're going to find them both. So I've looked at people that are somewhat successful, and I feel I'm a little bit successful. There's two kinds. There's one that says, you're stupid, I'm smart, that's why I'm where I am. And the other is, I could do it. You can do it too. Look, I was in your situation not too long ago, and I can do it also. That's the way I want to provide, that's the kind of place I want to be. I, I think I've tried to do that to some of the folks around here and be a mentor to the extent that I can. So I ask you for one favor. Can I ask you for one favor? Look for the best in this situation. Don't be a gossip. Don't be saying, yeah, they're this, they're that. Because if you look for that, you're always going to find it. You're always going to find it. And if you have issues and or problems, you can certainly come to me. I'm interested. I'm not ego driven. I'm mission driven. I want this to work really, really well. This is what I believe. I would ask you as a favor, if you feel that I've been loyal to you, to be loyal to me. And I would like to show another video. I got a feeling it's running down my spine. Despite the chaos, everything will be fine. We'll go from bottom to the top, from east to the west. Hear the siren call. Why not be the best? Yeah, why not be the best? Reach for the ceiling, Reach for the ceiling. And you may touch the sky But to reach that ceiling ooh, You gotta really try If you're looking in the mirror And you don't like what you see If you never really then there ain't no mystery You, yeah you You can be the best I like the darkness It helps me find the stars In times of trouble You find out who your friends really are so put the pedal to the metal, keep your eyes on the prize, get some fire in your belly, and some passion in your eyes. We, who, we can be the best. Do you got that feeling? Is it running down your spine? Some folks got off the bus, that's okay Cause now it's our time So take a step to the right Take a step to the left Ask yourself this question Why not be the best? Yeah So 
Let's all have each other's backs. Let's be the best that we can be, and we will thrive where others perhaps don't. It's an incredible honor to do the kind of stuff I do, to assemble the team like this. Every day is not perfect, nobody's perfect, but I think we're, we're killing it, we're doing well. Just a sec. What's the story? So let's just go into the next dimension. Let's do the best that we absolutely can.